Hey guys, let's talk autism. Okay, so in today's video, which you'll notice is much longer than my usual videos, we're going to go over autism in general and what it's like in the classroom. By the end of this video, hopefully I've given you a bit of a better understanding of autism from our younger kids up through our teen years. So if you're a primary teacher or secondary teacher, even a preschool teacher, hopefully some of this gives you a bit of insight into those kids needs in the classroom and even their needs outside of the classroom and how it can impact on their learning. So if you aren't used, uh, don't have the time to watch this one or aren't used to any of the buttons below, there is a button below that looks like a little clock where you can click on that and it will get added to your watch later list. If you click like on it, it will get saved to your liked videos. Or if you're someone who's watching this from one of the um, Facebook feeds, you can click on the little um, arrowy thing at the top there on the other side and there's a drop down box and it will say uh, save a video or save link, whatever it is. You can click on that so you can watch it later because this will be a bit lengthy, but I promise there's some really good information to come in this one. So hopefully you're sticking with me now. If not, I'll see you later. So today's video is going to be absolutely nowhere near as comprehensive as it should be in terms of understanding our kids' needs when it comes to autism. This is going to be a bit of an overview and insight for you guys. So in terms of my experience with autism, let me give you just a bit of a detail in terms of my background with it. So you know that what I'm telling you today just isn't a bunch of crap that I've read on the internet. Uh, I have a very big passion for um, children with special needs. I, out of my three degrees, one of them is a degree in special needs education. My first job was in an autism unit and every year of teaching, I've always had at least one child uh, with a diagnosis uh, that required funding. I've had, we all have many needs in our classes, but many of those students have been students with autism, on top of which I also have a son who has been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. So I've got two hats when I talk about autism. I've got my parent hat and I've got my teacher hat as well that I use when I talk about all of these different things. So this is why I'm going to give you a bit of a rounded perspective in terms of our kids needs when it comes to being in the classroom. I have my trusty notebook here because I knew this one was going to be a bit lengthy. So I wanted to write everything down and make sure I didn't skim over anything that I thought was really essential for you guys to know. So let's get to the crux of it. So autism spectrum disorder, it's a developmental disorder affecting the ability to communicate and interact. It requires a medical diagnosis, usually by a pediatrician. Uh, and it can affect things like behavior, delay in development, cognition, uh, psychological issues, things like anxiety and sensory issues as well. That's broad. It's a spectrum. There's so many different degrees for our kids and different ways that it can affect them. So we need to know like any neurotypical child, any person with anything, there's different degrees to it and no two kids are going to be the same. Um, my son is nearly seven years old now and he was diagnosed just after he was two years of age. So I've been living, living with it. <laughs> I've been a parent of a, a child with autism for a little while now, and I can t definitely tell you it's changed, I guess, how I approach it in the classroom as well. So let's get into some of that. In, as a, as a parent, what it means when you get a diagnosis is is life-changing. It took me a full year to be able to say out loud that my son has autism. I could still do everything. I was on remote. I had all the experience. I had all the knowledge. I was never prepared for it to be part of my personal life that way. So we did the therapy. We did all of the activities. He was non-verbal and self-harming at the time. So it was very intense. And it still took me that year to be able to say it out loud. So when you're working with a student and working with parents of that student as well, you need to keep in mind it's not just a change for the child. It's a big life change for the parents as well. Suddenly their world will revolve around therapy and communication and funds and paperwork, lots and lots of paperwork, and that it's a new community that they belong to all of a sudden and they will need support too. So especially if you're working with a child that has been recently diagnosed, you need to make sure that you're 
keeping contact with those parents and making sure that they're taking care of themselves as well and let them know what support services they've got to access, that there are Facebook groups that they can access as well because if they've got the right support and they can take care of their child as best as they can at home, it will help you in the classroom as well. And that's not to add to your workload. When we work as a team together, it benefits everyone. Okay. For the child, though, what it means to have a diagnosis, for me, I don't see a diagnosis as a label. A lot of people see it as a label. It's a way to slap you know, a name on that child and say, this is what's wrong with them. Stick them in the corner. They're done. That's not how I see a diagnosis. That's never how I've seen it. I see a diagnosis as a key. It's a special key that can open many, many doors. A door to speech therapy, a door to occupational therapy, a door to a psychologist, a door to support services, to therapy groups, to funding, to um, professional development that you wouldn't otherwise have had access to. Um, If you think of it that way, you can really think of it as a way that says, uh, now I have the key to get a better understanding of that child and what I can do for them. So if you're a bit apprehensive about that diagnosis, Just think of all the things that it can open the door to that you wouldn't have without that bit of paper that says this child has autism spectrum disorder. Um, In terms of uh, the the student, the child and that diagnosis, depending on their age, they may have no idea that it exists. They may have no idea why they're seeing all the extra doctors or therapists or why they have all these lovely people in their life trying to help them. They may suddenly start medication, depending on what needs that they have. Autism often comes with other needs as well. Many kids have issues with sleeping. I know my son did a little bit, but um, obviously it's a spectrum. There's different needs. Some kids end up going on medication uh, like melatonin to help them sleep. So if you have a child that comes in the morning that's often very sleepy, it's because they have irregular sleep patterns and difficulty getting to sleep at night. And this can come down to routine as well. So that's another thing that you need to touch base with parents about um, if they're showing that they're pretty, you know, sluggish in the morning. Um, Sorry, I'm just referring back to my notes here to make sure I don't miss anything there. Uh, Okay, so let's go to sensory needs. So when that child walks into your classroom first thing in the morning, whether you're primary or secondary again, doesn't matter, That child might be very sensitive to lots of different elements in the room, things like the noise, the lights, the smells. If you've got a breakfast club or something going on and that's suddenly a different smell that you normally wouldn't have in a classroom or uh, in a science lab and you've got chemicals going on, uh, cooking room, uh, visual arts and the smell of paints, or if you're in industrial arts and the smell of wood, all those things can differ um, their sensory needs. things that they can touch as well. So one classroom might have vinyl floors, one classroom might have carpets, one might have lounges to sit on and one might have sturdy tables. All those differences, depending on the child, can affect their sensory overload. Uh, And there's ways that you can minimize it. So obviously knowing those child sensitivities, talking to the parents, finding out what they like, what they don't like, asking the child what they like, what they don't like, ask them where they like to sit or where they like to work and what feels good for them and why they like it or why they dislike it. It could just mean having, you know, if they like carpet and the room is vinyl, if it's a science lab and it's sterile and they like carpet, just getting a carpet square for their hand, getting that tactile um, calming sensation for them, having that in the classroom, find what they like and, and let them have that with them to help keep them calm. Uh, having quiet areas in the room. So things like pop tents, if you've got those where they can go in and shut out um, the noise cancellation headphones or just an iPod with music, with music that they like. I know a lot of people think that, that that's a reward, but when it comes to these kids, if it calms them down, that's what they need to do their best learning. I like working with music. Um, if you've got lots of clutter on the walls, that can be very overwhelming. And we know that the brain is constantly trying to decode things that it sees. So if it's nothing but stuff all over the walls, that's a lot of overwhelming information there for the brain to take in. So breaking it up with um, bold borders, thick borders, so not those, not thin strips between the work. I like to have it plain on the back and then just the piece of work that's hanging there or the, uh, the display, whatever it is that's there. So I normally have in my classroom, sorry, I'm just getting comfy there. I have 
what are they called? The three M hooks and then string tied to it and then just the work pegged to it. So I don't have the big uh, push board, cork board, whatever it is that you've got. I don't have those with, you know, fancy borders or anything around it. I like to just keep it plain with the work that's there. Makes it easier for the eye to draw to and the, all that clutter is gone. There's not those distractions that can be there and create a sensory overload. Um, uh, the opportunity to have a, a desk facing the wall. So this is good for those moments where it becomes overwhelming. So if you've got, a, this isn't about shutting the student away. This is just about giving them a space where they can be calm and work the best that they can. So if you've got a blank wall or even a wall that has their visuals on it, a way where they can go and not be distracted by everything else that's going on around them, having that space there is good too. Structure and organization. So once you've come into the room and that room, you know, works well for them, having that routine is best. Kids with, uh, sorry, kids that have autism spectrum disorder thrive on routine and structure. So having that organization in place, having the routine in place and having it set out in advance. So for some kids, this means having a visual timetable uh, on the desk, it could be in the form of photos or using pictures from the program's uh, PEX or board maker. You can use clip art and things that you find on the internet as well, but PEX and board, board maker are quite a universal system as well. So they're, and they're easy to use. They can be expensive, but a lot of schools have them. If you don't have them, if you Google PEX board maker, tons of stuff comes up. Um, and you can just make things that are step by step. You could have the whole day if need be the whole week if need be. And if you're in secondary, I know that's a bit more difficult, but I mean, you as a teacher with your period, you could have your period lined up, whether it's your intro or if you're doing an experiment or if you're doing a music lesson, you can still have those visuals there in place so the student knows what's expected of that lesson, what's going to happen, and how will I know when the lesson's done? Because that way they're prepared for it and that anxiety reduces and they know what they're going to be doing. They can participate fully. If you've got unexpected changes. This is what makes it hard for students with autism to deal with. They know what's going to happen. They're planned for that. They've got that in their mind. Um, and then something changes out of the ordinary. It could be anything from, you know, today we're just going to have free play or today's the disco or um, it's raining and we can't go outside to play. I like to have a visual that's a symbol for when there's a change coming. So it could be a question mark, could be a special star, or it could be a smiley face. It could be something that the, the child has chosen as well. And that sits there. So when I can go, we know what this symbol means. We've discussed this. We know this means that there's going to be a change. This is the change. And I usually ask the child to put that onto their visual timetable or on their desk or wherever it is, wherever it is that they are working so that they can acknowledge there is a change coming. I accept there is a change coming. I know what I need to do. That physicality of it helps as well. Um, if there is a special event coming and you want to prep that child, have the visual, have the talk, and do a countdown. If you've got a calendar in your classroom, put it on the calendar so they know that it's coming. For my son at home, we have a family calendar, and on his calendar he has his therapy days, he has his school days. If we've got like we've got a birthday party this weekend, so that's on the calendar as well. His dad's birthday is coming up, so that's on the calendar as well. So that he knows it's coming. He can verbalize that it's coming. We can talk about how fun it's going to be and how wonderful it's going to be. So the, he doesn't have that anxiety building up to it. He's still going to have some though. We know that he's still going to have that anxiety, but at least he's more prepared for it so that when it's actually happening, it's not as overwhelming as what it would be. Okay. Uh, using those visuals for communication. So in terms of this spectrum of autism, some kids are verbal, some kids are nonverbal. And often those children that are nonverbal will respond to, to visual cues. But that doesn't mean just having it on the desk chart. It could mean having a lanyard with basic ones. So if you're in preschool, you might have things like sit, toilet, wash hands, eat. Um, going through the years, it could end up being things like um, not hitting, sitting with legs crossed, um, saying please, yes, no, so they can point to the visual if need be. And it's good to reinforce that to point it. If you can get them to point it and say it, if that's the next step, if you're moving on to verbalization, that would be great. Sometimes kids are verbal, but then they will go non-verbal when they're having a meltdown or a sensory overload. 
if they move into that nonverbal mode, that's when you pick up the visuals and use them. It's not like you're going backwards to do that. You're meeting their needs when you do that. So <clears throat> whether it's a desk chart or a lanyard flip card system or whatever, or if you've got posters around, rip it off, put them in front of their face, make them point to it. Get hand over hand if you need to. Which one do you want? Which one do you need? What are you trying to tell me? Um, and even if they are verbal, they might just not be in the mood to talk. You can use it. You can point to it and see if they give you a response. If then being completely um, non-responsive and not making any eye contact, but suddenly they do when you point to that one picture, it's a good cue that that's what they're after. Uh, there's a difference between using the photos and the pictures as well. It's a progression. So depending on the, the level that the, the child is at, you might start with photos, move on to pictures. You might move on to very explicit steps in your photos and then break it down later into smaller steps. So it might be pick up pencil, write, put pencil away, put book away. And that could be one whole strip. Or if you're at the next level, it might just be English, music, maths, and then free time. I usually like to do the three activities and then free choice. So once they've done those things, you can either put a finished sticker on it or put it in the finished box or put a tick on it, whatever works for you and your student, and then get to the reward part. So they know I might not like doing these things, but I'm going to get to do the thing that I like doing. Um, okay. Next one is tantrums versus meltdowns. I'm about halfway through now, guys. So if you're still with me, thank you. <laughs> So the difference between a tantrum and a meltdown. When you think of tantrum, think of the two-year-old tantrum, the terrible twos. They throw themselves on the floor, they kick and scream, and then they look up to see if you're watching them because they want your attention. A meltdown is very, very different. A meltdown is not to gain your attention. A meltdown is because there's been so much overwhelming, it could be a sensory overload, an emotional overload, an anxiety overload to the point where their emotions have shut down and they cannot control what they're doing. And this could come in any form. It could be tears. It could just be nonverbal. It could be being aggressive and violent. And at that point, they're not looking at you seeking for attention. This is a coping me mechanism now. So when a, a student goes into a meltdown like this, if it's violent, I, you almost think of it like a seizure. You need to move the other kids away move anything else away where they could damage themselves or hurt hurt themselves or hurt others and remove from the classroom. Make sure someone's still got eyes on that student. So even if it means getting the kids into the classroom next door, letting that teacher watch them while you go back and make sure that other child is safe. Um, if that child is just shutting down, it might mean giving the option to go to a quiet area, to having a self timeout. And giving a self timeout is a good option for kids. I have a timeout tag that just sits up on the wall and the students that know this, they, they know that they can go and grab it and show it. They don't even have to say, I need a timeout. They can just grab it and use it. Having that as an option is a good one as well. But the difference between the tantrum and the meltdown is with a tantrum, you pretty much can look at a consequence at that point. With a meltdown, you need to let them finish and calm because anything you say is not going to go in. It's going to be, it's going to be pretty much non-responsive. They need that time to de-stress afterwards and think about what they did. And a lot of those kids will often express regret, remorse, shame, embarrassment after it's done because they feel so out of control of what they their body is doing. And it depends on the age as well. Older kids might be able to verbalize it later and, and say what they did and why they did it and how they could have done it differently. And younger kids may not have even realized what they've done. They might not have even realized they've thrown something across the room. And when you say you shouldn't be throwing things, they'll go, but I didn't. So that dialogue needs to happen afterwards and it needs to be a good chunk of time after they've calmed down. Make sure they're right down. They'll often be tired afterwards as well because it does take a lot of energy to have that meltdown. A lot of students can keep it together at school throughout the day and then as soon as they get home, they have a meltdown. And it's because they've, they've tried to keep themselves together the whole time throughout the school day, doing the right thing, following instructions, listening to the teacher, sitting still, and then they get home, it's a safe place, they're comfortable, they love mum and dad, and it, it just all comes out at home. So uh, don't be surprised either if parents will come up and say they had a terrible afternoon and you'll be like, but they were great at school, I don't know what happened. Often they're keeping it together. So 
if you if find that that's a pattern with any of your students and the parents are telling you that, I would um, recommend using some de-stress activities throughout the day kind of as preventatives. So even though they don't need it to calm down, it's establishing that sense of calm throughout the day so they're not trying to hold it in and keep it together for the whole day and then get home and just release all of that stress. Um, you want that sense of calm to go throughout the whole day. So there's different things like brushing, breathing exercises, pressure exercises. And obviously these are all things that you'd probably need to go and type into Google for more information. It would take way too long to go through everything now. I'm not going to give you everything now. There's no way I could cover it all now. Um, to support your child, use your use the speechy, use the OT, use the psychologist, the pediatrician, your learning support team, the school counsellor. Talk with parents. If you can get all those people in one room together to create an individual education plan, then that's amazing. I've managed to do it a lot of times before. It's not always an easy thing to do, but if you can get all of those people in one room together, it's an amazing sense of commitment to see so many people dedicated to one child. It supports the parents, it supports the students. It's really hard to do, but if you can do it, if you can do it, it's amazing. Make sure you're regularly reviewing their goals as well, looking at what they've achieved, setting the next goal. Almost done. Make sure you build a relationship with that child. When it comes to autism, I guess in a sense they're in their own world and you can't reef them out of it. You can't pull them into your world. You need to enter into their world. If they like Lego, get into Lego. If they like Pokemon, get into Pokemon. If they like Bob the Builder, which is what one student had, I stuck Bob the Builder pictures on every piece of work we ever did so that he would engage with it. Um, it's silly to think of, but like you, I, I'd never had a cat before until I started dating my husband and I had to be taught that cats don't like you to go up to them and constantly pat them. Cats will come to you when they're ready to come to you. And I kind of had to think of it that way with my own son. He didn't, he didn't want me to constantly enter his world all the time and get into his face. I had to wait for him to be ready and come to me. So even though I was building that bridge by playing with cars and playing with trains and sitting next to him, I still didn't force him. I still waited till he came to me. And that's part of building that good relationship and that comfort level and that trust with them. They will come to you when, when they're ready, even if they're not making eye contact with you, even if they're not verbal, they're listening, they're watching. We know these kids aren't, aren't doing nothing. They're not just sitting there doing nothing. We know they're taking things in. They're just doing it differently. And sometimes that can be very frustrating as a teacher to think that there's no response to what's going on and that nothing is being taken in, but it is. You can trust that it is. Every child can learn. Every single child can learn. Those barriers that exist when it comes to autism spectrum disorder or any need in our kid is just a barrier. It's not a brick wall that will never come down. It's not something we can't get over. It just means we have to do it differently. And like I said, when it comes to autism, it's a passion of mine. I hate to, to think that there is a child just sitting in a corner, not having their needs met. And it's, it's hard to do. It's hard in our classrooms because we have, we don't just have one need in our class. We've got up to 30 needs in our class, but hopefully this might give you um, just a bit of insight into what you can do for those kids with autism. I know there's so much more that I could go into. I've only briefly touched on it and I'm looking at my time and now I think I've hit 23 minutes or something at the moment. So I'm going to put lots of links below to inspirational talks about autism. Um, Temple Grandin has to be one of the best people you could watch talk about autism and her story is amazing. And if you can see her daytime movie, it's amazing as well. I'll put some other links in there um, that where you could go for research for autism. But if you've got one of those students in the class, I hope that some of that has helped you. Google any words in there that I'm not sure about. If, if you want me to go into detail specifically about one particular area, chuck a comment below or um, on my Facebook page, send me a message on my Facebook or my Twitter, and I'll happily do another video going into more detail about specific areas. Like I said, this, this one's close to my heart, so I want to help any teacher as best as I can meet those needs in the classroom. I do have other videos coming up soon um, about other special needs in the classroom. Like I said, that's part of my qualifications and my passions, so happy to help out any way I can. Um, if you haven't subscribed, I'd love you to click the button below, red subscribe button. If you're someone who's not a YouTuber, like I said, go to Facebook and like me on there and you can follow that way. 
Um, but otherwise, hopefully this one wasn't too long for you and I hope it helped you out. If it did help you out, please leave me a thumbs up so I know I'm helping some people. Okay, guys. Thanks. Bye.